everything is competing for your attention. And when you give something a like, it becomes a recorded transaction attributing value. The problem is that in our social media, we are the product and we're letting others attribute value to us. Everything you want, instant gratification. The best case scenario is you'll have an entire population growing up and going through life and just never really finding joy. I believe there's a hero in all of us. Gives us strength, makes us noble. Uh, if you weren't here last week, you won't know that we started a brand new series. It's all about social media. It's about how we live authentic, meaningful lives in a photoshopped world. How we live no filter. And last week, we, we, we took the very foundation, which is about how you feel about yourself. Unless you have a decent sense of the value that you have as an individual, you'll never fulfill your potential. You'll never be everything that God wants you to be. And so we talked about that. We talked about how God actually gives us intrinsic value. That there's something about the fact that we were made by him and chosen by him to do amazing things for him that actually gives us a sense of worth. Today, we want to take that forward. And we've been looking, uh, no filter, at the life of King David. Because this is someone that was a hero. And this is someone that inspires us to do heroic things. And just as he found that sense of self-worth when God pointed the finger and said, I chose you, I made you, I've got great things for you. So God says the same thing to us. And we see how David steps into his destiny. Tonight, some of you, you're going to step into something brand new. You're going to discover a sense of destiny, purpose, meaning, heroism that you've never had before. Some of you are students, and I remember when I was a student, back when the world was young, I was doing mechanical engineering. I tipped up at the Queen's building my first day. There was a professor. His name was... Professor Bones, true story, the man was quite crazy. He had hair, just white, wiry shock of hair, like an explosion in a mattress factory, just coming out of his head, round glasses, crazy demeanor. He filled this whole blackboard. I told you it was a long time ago when I was at university. But he had this massive blackboard at the front of the lecture theater, and he filled it with all these different illustrations, diagrams, equations, phrases, words. And when he got to the end of the space on the blackboard, he did a curious thing, something I'd never seen before. Because I'd been in school, and I'd seen people fill up a blackboard, and I'd seen teachers routinely scrub the blackboard. And so this is what Professor Bones did. He took the board rubber for the blackboard, and he took his other hand and put it up, and then he did this kind of movement. With this hand, he has the rubber. With this hand, it's just, I don't know what he's going to do. I've never seen it. He looks like he's about to conduct an orchestra. And he goes like this. He rubs the board like this. We're all looking at him thinking, what is this guy on? Why is he rubbing the board like that? We've never seen anyone rub the board like that. He turns around after he's finished rubbing the board and he kind of looks at us and he says, ladies, gentlemen, you're probably wondering why I rub the board like this. Why this hand is doing the rubbing while this hand is just shaking in sympathy. We uh, were indeed wondering. He says, I bet when you had your teachers at school, they didn't rub the board like that. I said, no, it's true. They didn't rub the board like that. He says, the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing is the reason that I'm better than the teachers that you had at school. And it's the reason that you are going to be better than you were at school. It's the reason that you're going to succeed. It's the reason that you're going to go far. It's the reason that you're going to accomplish great things. It's what's going to make you a winner. See, what I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm applying engineering principles. I'm applying science. Now, this is what happens. If I were to rub the board like this, what I am doing in engineering speak is putting my body under an out-of-balance moment. And an out-of-balance moment means that there is stresses and shocks put through my body, and the end result is that my bottom jiggles. Behold, my bottom is jiggling. We looked, yes, his bottom was jiggling. He said, I bet every time a teacher in your school rubbed the board, their bottom jiggled. Yes, I was wondering about that bottom jiggling business. 
The reason their bottom jiggled was that they were subjecting themselves to an out-of-balance moment. And what I do want to bring this hand in sympathy and move it in contramotion is that now I cancel out the out-of-balance moment. There's no bottom wiggle. We all rose to our feet. Yes, we applauded him. No bottom wiggle. This man is a genius. He says, this is what you need to do. You're here to learn. You're here to study. And this is how you win. This is how you get to go to where you need to go, the appliance of science. And what Mr. Bones, Professor Bones, was saying is he's saying, these are the rules of engagement. Here's how we know who wins. This is how the game is played. Technology will make you win. Technology will make you succeed. Application of scientific principles will make you successful in life. I went away. This is amazing. I just thought this. So I was there in my room. I was in Will's Hall. Nice room overlooking the quad in the old building. And uh, I had a piece of paper and I started writing some stuff in pencil. And then, oops, made a mistake. I'm applying what I've learned. I take my rubber, one hand, take my other hand, ready to be in sympathetic motion, did the erasing, <laughs> paper flies out and uh, goes everywhere. But I. I'm not deterred. I determined to um, put this into practice. So go to bed at night, got my little sink in my little room, get my toothbrush, brush my teeth like this. <laughs> go to meet people the next day. Hi, my name's Philip. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Thinking I've got what I need to succeed. These are the rules of engagement. This is how we know who wins. This is how the game is played. And I went through, honestly, with that attitude that if I can just get all my learning, if I can work hard, apply myself, if I can get brainy, if I can take what my teachers and lecturers and professors are giving me, then I will win. Then I will move forward and I will have the kind of successful life because that's what they sold. That's what they said. This is how you win. This is how the game is played. The person that wins is the person that has science, technology, application, experience, knowledge on their side. You can win. Here's the thing. Last week we talked about the three biggest diagnoses on UK campuses being anxiety, depression, and stress. And we said that it was a peculiar problem with the millennial generation, those born and aged between 18 and 30. Five. We talked about high levels of social media use lead to high levels of mental health problems. That they're not bad in themselves, but they are somehow making us a little bit crazy. Well, listen, in my day, it was the same thing. There were still people, and I discovered that people on my course, people literally on my course, my friends, were facing far bigger giants than how to be a little bit more effective and efficient at doing some work. Actually, I found friends of mine with depression. I found friends of mine with relationship breakdowns. I found friends of mine crumbling under the stress, under the, the pressure of it all. In my first year, two of my friends tried to kill themselves. I don't think it's because I was their friend, but I think they were going through some stuff, and I could not believe it, that these guys, they've been told, these are the rules of engagement. Here's how we know who wins. This is how the game is played. And we all dutifully went along, kowtowing to that line, and yet there are bigger giants to face. There are bigger giants out there. And how do you beat the giant? How do you face down that thing which is threatening to crush you, to take away your joy, to leave you feeling diminished and not knowing where to turn? So we look in this instance, in the life of David, it's David fought his giant. And the giant was called Goliath. Now, you may be here, you may not be a church person, but I guarantee that you know the name Goliath, because it's gone into the modern lexicon. It's into our, our kind of consciousness as a culture, a David and Goliath story. Put your hand up if you've heard the expression, the David and Goliath story. Okay, keep your hand up if you know what David and Goliath means, what a David and Goliath story means, if, if we say that. Put your hands up. Okay, do you really? See, most people, when they use David and Goliath, I get the impression that they've never read the story of David and Goliath. Because we talk about David and Goliath like it's a kind of Leicester City, you know, overcoming in the football world. Or it's like in fiction where Rocky Balboa 
or creed. Uh, they, they do this underdog story. So David versus Goliath. Whenever we talk about someone who's the underdog, the absolute one against whom all the odds are stacked, fighting impossible opposition, we say David and Goliath, David and Goliath, David and Goliath. But that's not what David and Goliath is about. David and Goliath is about something entirely different. And it's possible that you're here. Maybe you you are a church person. You've been around church all along. You've been through Sunday school. You've heard the story of David and Goliath. You think you understand it, but you don't. Perhaps you think it's all about being the underdog. Certainly for most people who are outside of the church, that's how they read the story. Utterly, totally, completely wrong. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're wrong. Let me tell you, let me tell you about David and Goliath. David and Goliath takes place around about 3,000 years ago. So it's 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. It's in the late Bronze Age, and it's between two warring people. The Philistines are a seafaring, warring people, and they are on the eastern coast of uh, Palestine. The Jewish nation are further inland, and they've got their territory, which is adjacent to the Philistine territory, the territory of Judah. <laughs> Uh, Judea, where it's, um, it's Jerusalem, it's Hebron, it's Bethlehem. And uh, these towns are constantly being overrun by the Philistines who are pushing in. Now, during this time in history, the Philistines had the edge over the Israelite people. They had basically ground them into submission until the people call out for a king, King Saul. King Saul comes along and he actually starts to turn the tide against the Philistine raiders who are pushing their territory back. And King Saul has a number of clashes and and battles with the Philistines. And it culminates in this one final boss battle. It happens in the Valley of Elah. This is how the thing shapes out. You have the Philistines coming in from southeast of Jerusalem. They come in from the coast, from their their coastal towns. And they take camp on this one range of hills, this kind of mountainous range. Then there's the Valley of Elah, which is about a half mile wide, in the middle with a, a, a dry riverbed running down the center of it. And then the other side, another mountain range. And the Israelites are camped there. And there's a standoff. Neither army can attack against the other because the moment that you come down into the valley, the army just waits for you to come up the mountain. And if you try to come up the mountain fighting another army, they have the high ground, they have the advantage, they will prevail. So whichever army moves first, blinks first, is going to get defeated. And there's so much at stake. If they can win this battle, the Philistines will finally snuff out the resistance from the Israelites. And if the Israelites can win this battle, they get their country back. They get to push the Philistines back. They deliver a decisive blow. So there's a standoff. No one wants to move until this one giant comes out. The giant is called Goliath. And Goliath, he basically determines what the rules of engagement are going to be. He says, here's how we know who wins. This is how the game is played. The Bible gives us an account of Goliath. And it's not like a mythical, unrealistic, unrational uh, account. It says, and we have different accounts um, in different manuscripts, but it's somewhere between a height of six foot nine and uh, eight foot nine that this giant is standing tall. He is someone that is within the bounds of human possibility, but a freak of nature. He has this incredible bronze army the Bible describes. In fact, the the Bible gives us this fantastic, fascinating detail. If you want to read the book of Daniel, uh, David, his story is all through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. It's the longest narrative in any of the scriptures apart from the life of Jesus. But it tells us this detail. It says his armor weighed the equivalent of of nine stone. Put your hands up if you weigh nine stone. Matt Crossman, put your hand down. Nine stone is how much his armor weighed. The tip of his spear was around about seven kilograms. That's seven bags of sugar. And he stands out and he starts to taunt day and night. For 40 days, he taunts the Israelite army. And this is what he says. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and let him come down to me. 
If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So the giant, he says, this is how we know who wins. These are the rules of engagement. This is how the game is played. Seeing as there's a standoff, I will tell you how we're going to fight this out. It's going to be man to man. It's going to be single armed combat. And so Goliath comes out and he is heavy infantry. He is the tallest man in the whole Philistine army. Now, on the other side, the equivalent man would be Saul, King Saul himself. In fact, the Bible specifically tells us that King Saul was head and shoulders above every other man in the nation of Israel. He was their champion. He was their guy. He was the one that you would expect to go out and win the battle. And so Goliath says, instead of us being stuck in deadlock or having a slaughter between the two armies, one person, a a death match, battle royale, one person against one person, and whoever wins, winner takes all. And of course, the, the Israelites are terrified because they see a giant. And the giant is setting the agenda. The giant is saying, this is how we know who wins. These are the rules of engagement. This is how we play the game. And no Israelites wants to play this game. No one wants to face this giant. Because this is what happens. When there's a giant in your life, You don't want to fight that giant. You don't know how to handle that giant. And the giant in your life will always dictate terms to you. The giant in your life will always tell you, this is how the game is played. This is what we're going to do. And Goliath's greatest weapon was not the bronze sword that he wielded, but his words, his intimidation, his threats, his ridicule. So powerfully that when David comes and he's sent by his father from Bethlehem with provisions for his brother. Now David comes in probably around the age of 15 years old. He's traveled for for days to get to the front line. And when he comes and inquires about this, his own brother Eliab, his eldest brother who's fighting, a, a trained fighting man. He says, who do you think you are? You're nothing. You're wicked. You're deceitful. Because even David's brother fights and engages and plays the game like Goliath says this is to be played. And Goliath plays it with ridicule and he plays it with intimidation. He plays it with bullying and threats. And so the Israelites, that's the game we play and that even gets poured down onto David. When you fight a giant, and we all have giants in our lives, they have weapons that come against us and they have weapons that terrify us just like the Israelites were terrified. For some of you, the giant that you face, and let me say this as as gently and as sensitively as I can, but for some of you, the giant that you face is depression. Depression. And when depression comes against you, that giant will use weapons like despair, intimidation. That giant will say, depression, you'll never be free of me. You'll never get this off your back intimidation, you're never going to be whole. You're always going to hold people back. You'll never have an out. You'll never have an exit. You'll never have an escape route. Intimidation, threats, despair. There's no way. It's black and it's dark and you can't get out. For some of you, the, the giant is actually work. And the enemy, the weapons that work uses is actually stress and bullying. In other words, work, whether that's academic work, whether that's work in the job that you do, the the, the weapon that's used against is stress, stress, stress. You've got to do work all the time. You've got to give it your all. You can't afford to slack up. And when I talk about bullying, I'm talking about when work says to you, in effect, we have the power, we can sack you, or we can promote you. We can fail your degree, or we can give you something that is a passport to your future. And if you don't do things the way we want you to do it, then you will fail. It's a giant. The number of people, and we talked about this, we had our earlier uh, series on the workplace, and stress is one of the biggest things. So now stress is the biggest reason for people taking time of work because it's a giant 
And it will come down on you. And it will say, you've got to work harder. You can't take time off. The day off as Sabbath, are you crazy? You've got to give and give and give. And you cannot slack up. And some of you, even as you've started your university careers, you feel that giant calling out at you, saying, you've got to work hard. You've got to give everything. You can't slack. You can't lay up for a moment. For some of you, the giant is self-worth. We talked about this last time. And and the the weapons are comparison and fear. We compare ourselves with other people. And that's why social media can be so dangerous if we don't handle it with wisdom. Because it's all about comparison. 200 likes is better than 20 likes. And when you feel down on yourself and self-worth is the giant. And you look at things that you post and you think, how come I only got this number of likes when I shared my new relationship status? And my friend got so many more when they shared their relationship status. It wasn't even a proper relationship. And comparison, a comparison trap. Or the fear, the fear, the fear that if people really knew me like I really am, they wouldn't like me. And our sense of worth is denigrated. What about sexual brokenness? Sexual brokenness, the weapons of shame condemnation shame and condemnation where whether it's an addiction to pornography or whether it's been a, a broken sexual history that you've got the sense of shame the sense of dirtiness the sense of guilt and you say to yourself i never imagined that i would become like this i never imagined that i would do these things i never imagined that i would end up like this And for some of us, you get into situations and you just feel fleetingly good in the moment and then afterwards, you're covered in shame. And then the giant says, condemnation. Yeah, you are shameful. Yes, you're dirty. No one will want you. You are disgusting. You are dirty. You are used up. Lies that the giants tell us. For some, the giant is finance or financial worries. And here, it's, it's fear of missing out. And it's worry. Sometimes the fear of missing out. It's a giant. It says to you, you've got to have this stuff. You've got to have this thing. You've got to spend money and, and get that thing. And then you're going to be happy. And it, it tells us these things. It says, these are the rules of engagement. This is how the game is played. This is how we know who wins. The one with the most toys, when they die, that's the winner. And that worry, when you get into debt, You're never going to get out of this. You've got yourself in such a hole. You might as well give up. You can't handle this. This is too much for you. The giant talks. The giant talks. And for some of you, it's eating disorders. And and that giant will say, it's peer pressure. And it's self-hate. Look at you. You're no good. No one would love you. You don't have the right look. You don't have the right body. You don't have the right image. You're... Not worthy. You're less than everybody else. You you should just give up. You have no value, no worth, no right. All these things, the pressure to be like everybody else, the pressure to be a certain kind of person. And the giants, they speak these words and they tell us, these are the rules of engagement. This is how you deal with the giant. So if you want to be in work, this is the rules of engagement. Work, 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 work. If you want to Get ahead, then you've got to do what everyone else does. You cannot take time out. You cannot indulge yourself. All these other things that you might think are important, they have to go because work is the most important thing. Okay, that's how the rules are played. That's how the game is played. These are the rules of engagement. This is how I know who is the winner. The story of David. David. Is that David changes the rules. He says, I'm not playing this game. This is not how the game is played. These are not the rules of engagement for me. This is not how I win. I don't see a giant. I don't see difficulty. I don't see opposition. I don't see something terrifying. What I see is opportunity. It says this. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done? Everyone say, what will be done? What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. In other words, everyone is saying, ah, it's a giant. It's a difficulty. It's a problem. In David's case, wow, this is an opportunity. So what do I get when I kill this thing? He just sees it as this great thing. How many of you, when you have a problem in your life, or when you have something that rears its ugly head, how many of you think, oh no, it's awful. It's going to crush me. It's going to tear me down. And how many of you think, great, 
Here's an opportunity. Let me see what God can do with this totally different ball game. And then he redefines the whole thing. He says this. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Everyone say uncircumcised Philistine. (laughs) That he should defy the armies of the living God. Everyone say living God. So when Goliath speaks and taunts and defies the armies morning and night for 40 days, he says this, I am a Philistine, you are the armies of Saul. David says, excuse me, question, just at the back. Okay, uh, I have a different definition of who you are. You're a Philistine, sure, but you are an uncircumcised Philistine. Meaning, not some kind of racial slur or some weird anatomical kind of insult. What he's saying is, you're not part of the covenant people of God. You're outside of God's promise. You see, Israelites were circumcised. Male Israelites were circumcised as a physical sign that said, you are special. You're different. You're set apart. You are under God's care. You're under his authority and he will fight for you and he will work for you and he will bless you and he will take care of you. You're in covenant. It's like you're married to the, the living God. And he says, well, not just the armies of Saul. Saul just happens to be our king's nice guy, but he's, he's, just, he's just a man. We're really the armies of the living God. My friend, you just stumbled into the armies of the living God. And so he goes to Saul and he says, listen, I can do this. I can do this. This is okay. You should, you should be cool because it's God and God can do stuff. And this is the reaction that he got. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. You're 15 years old. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine, let me repeat, will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me From the hand of this Philistine. In other words, the overnight success of David was was not an overnight success. There's something that's been said about millennials, those between ages 18 and 35, that millennials somehow, they want instant success. You want instant gratification. You want everything handed to you on a plate. You don't want to go through any of the hardship, the difficulties. You just want instant fulfillment, instant satisfaction, instant results. That millennials will leave jobs early after just a couple of years because they haven't been fulfilled in them or they haven't got what they really wanted rather than the good old baby boomers who really put in the work and put in the hours and the years and they drugged on and they won the war and all these kinds of things. And Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I think that might be a little bit harsh. You know what I think? I think everyone is like that. We all, I don't care what generation you are, we all want the shortcut. We all want to get there instantly. But David says, there's something about the process that I have been through that I see a giant, and this is not my first time of trusting God. Because when I, as a shepherd, am out in the field and the lion comes along, and I've got my sheep, I've got my hundred sheep, and the lion takes one in its mouth and starts to carry it off. I don't go back home to dad and say, hey, dad, I'm so sorry, but we lost one today. And dad says, oh, but at least you're okay. And we've got the other 99 sheep. No, David says, listen, like a certain someone that you're going to meet a little bit later on, I leave the 99 behind. I run after the lion. I take my lamb and I strike it down because I believe that God is with me. Because David had that deep-seated sense that God knew him, made him, and had chosen him. God with us. God for us. No one can come against, no one can stand against us. David had that. He slew the lion. And when the bear came, Actually, probably standing on its hind legs, bigger than any Goliath. He says, I struck down that bear. Because I have a secret history with God. I have processed. I've been through some stuff. 
And you have big giants to face, but you need to know that there are certain things that you have right before you right now that you can actually, you can see God move for you. You can test God. You can prove God. It's not just a case if you wake up one day and you slay a giant. No, what it is is that you, bit by bit, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, you allow God to do great things in your life and you take victories for God. In my life, I've had many different fights, many different battles, and I have seen God deliver me from all of them. I've seen God take me from little fights, and then I can take a bigger fight, and then another fight comes along, and before you know it, you are killing giants. I told some of you um, back in the summer when we were talking about work and the principle of the Sabbath. You know, work, that giant stress and bullying. You've got to conform and you've got to give everything. And you work all the time. And if you want this degree and if you want this qualification, you've got to give everything. And then God can just take a back seat for a little while. And church can take a back seat and, and all those other things. And you don't have time to pray. You don't have time to read your Bible. Me and my friends, third years, universities, we just said, listen, we're not going to work on... On Sundays, we're going to take that off. We're going to have a Sabbath. And uh, we, I remember putting out deck chairs in the, um, on the lawns, uh, a hall, and uh, playing frisbee and having a, a beatbox because it was the 80s. And uh, just relaxing and chilling. And everyone says, what are you doing? You're crazy. There's a giant. Run for your lives. We're saying, we don't play the game like this. These are not the way that we decide who wins. We trust God. We are children of the living God. And I remember we called ourselves the feasty boys, because we all ate feast ice creams as we relaxed and reclined on our chairs. And we all got first class degrees. We got to slay the lion. We got to slay the bear. And as you move through your process of discipleship, and if you're not a believer here, if you're not a church person, or if you're on the edge, if it's been a while for you, you're a little bit tender, maybe you've been hurt by church, I want you to know that this is a place where we will help you go through a process. We will help you take the steps, start to fight some battles, start to see God do things in your life. And if you've been around, you know that our vision is this. We exist to help people find Jesus, which is why we want you to do the Alpha course. It's amazing. And then when you found Jesus, to love one another, which is why we put people in hubs. So if you're here and you've been coming along to Metro, you're not yet in a hub, go and see the guys. They'll be by the sofa, by the coffee machine at the end. They can tell you there's a hub on a Wednesday, hub on a Thursday, there's student hubs. These midweek groups where you love one another, you start to move forward. And then follow Jesus. We have a system, a program, then we just... Spooling it up to speed of mentoring where we help one another. Okay, let's fight some battles. Let's see you defeat these things. Maybe the depression is too big right now. Maybe finance, you got yourself into such a hole. But hey, let's look at some lions and let's look at some bears. And before you know it, the giant will come tumbling and then serve the city. And so we're all about a process, taking people on a process. And if you're wanting to be part of us, that's where we're going. We're going to change this city. We're going to radically transform Bristol for Jesus because we are on a mission. We are part of the armies of the living God. And so David, he goes up. He says this. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give all of you into our hands. That's why David refused Saul's armor. When Saul said, listen, there's something about you, kid. You, you clearly have an experience of God. Take my arm. He says, that's not how the game is played. It's not about the sword. It's not about the spear. It's not the size of the giant that you face. It's the size of the God that you serve. He has this sling, a leather pouch with two leather cords attached to it. You hold them together. You put your boulder in the center of the pouch. You spool it up, six or seven revolutions a second. And Goliath comes like, what is this? Is this some kind of a joke, a kid with a little toy and a stick, a shepherd boy? What is this? 
And David lets fly the stone. Hits Goliath straight in the forehead. Stops him. Falls like a tree. David wanders over. Grabs a hold of the sword of Goliath. The very thing that was supposed to hurt him, he takes and he kills his giant. And when David is in the face-off with Goliath, I can just imagine it. I can just imagine David's swagger as he walks up and he says, Oh my goodness, Goliath, you've made a horrible miscalculation. You thought that you were fighting the armies of Saul. You're fighting the armies of the living God. You just brought a knife to a gunfight. You have no chance because with me, God is with me. And if God is with me, who can be against me? The giant that you face, I don't want to diminish its power and I don't want to make a triviality of its devastation. I don't want to belittle the pain that it has caused you, the ways in which it has hurt you. But I want you to know, tonight, tonight, we're going to see some giants stopped dead in their track. We're going to take the very thing that they wanted to use against you to kill it dead. D-E-D. Because God says, I know the giant that you face. But you know what? It's just part of your process. It's an opportunity. In fact, for David, this opportunity led to wealth. He got to marry the king's daughter. His entire family was exempt from taxes. Not just good for him, good for his whole family. Good for his position. He immediately became royalty. He immediately became rich. So when he sees Goliath, he says, whoopee doo, this is my lucky day. And when we see difficulties and when we see obstacles, when we see trial, when we see a giant... When we have that thing and it keeps you awake at night, or that stuff which is deep ingrained, listen, it may not be an overnight thing, but with God helping you, we are going to see those giants come tumbling down. And David and Goliath is not an underdog story. It's not a plucky kid against all odds. It's simply somebody who says, I believe God, I trust God, I know God, He is good, He is with me. And I'm not fighting like you want me to fight. I'm not going with your rules of engagement. I'm not going to muck around with your little sword and your little shield and your helmet. I've got the angel armies behind me. Paul said this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So, we're going to pray. We're going to pray together and we're going to do some stuff. Before we pray, here's the good idea, the big idea, just to kind of wrap this up neatly. It's this. Don't let a giant set the rules of engagement. We fight with spiritual weapons. In the name of Jesus, the living God, God of the angel armies, will rescue us from every giant we face. Some of this, it's still... It's going to require professional help. It's still going to require people to help us. It's still going to take a process to work through. Not all these things are overnight, but actually what is overnight is the power that it wields over you. What is overnight is the way that you frame the struggle, the way that you sit, the way that you perceive it. You walk in and you don't see a big obstacle in front of you anymore. You see opportunity. So what I want you to do is I want you to take this piece of paper from uh, under your seat And it says, my giant is. And I want you to take the pen that you've got. And in a moment, not just yet, in a moment, I want you to write one giant. It may be one word or it may be a description. And we're going to come, we're going to bring these things. We're going to pray together. We're going to bring these pieces of paper to the front. We're going to worship God. And we're going to do decisive damage to the powers of darkness and wickedness that have brought you down. But before we do that, let me just ask you to, to pray. And if you're not a church person and this is your first time here and you're thinking, sheesh, this is a bit intense, then just just be quiet. Just close your eyes. Maybe go with it. Even as a thought experiment, see what's the worst that could happen. Because if there is a God, and if he does love you, this 
This changes everything. So let's close our eyes, and I'm going to ask that God would bring to mind the giant that he wants to deal with tonight. Let's close our eyes. Spirit of the living God, I pray you'd reveal to us that thing that we need to see killed and destroyed and disarmed, disempowered in our lives right now. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, the things that you want to take down in our lives, just reveal them to us. Help us to put a name on it. Help us to know exactly what it is. For some of you, it's a relationship. It's a controlling or abusive relationship or it's something that holds sway (coughs) over you from the past. For others of you, it's 101 different things, but you know what it is. But to you, it feels like this big giant and it just, it tears you down. And just as that thing comes into your mind, why not write that down on the piece of paper? And then we're going to pray this prayer together, which is written at the bottom. And if this is all a bit too much for you, then don't worry. You can just watch everyone else do it. Okay, let's, um, let's pray this prayer together. What I want you to do is right now, I want you to look at the thing that you've written. I want you to name it inside your head. And then let's pray this prayer. All together. I come against you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the living God, the Lord God Almighty, God of the angel armies whom you have defied. He will rescue me from your hand. For the battle is the Lord's.